I'm here to talk about cash, I'm not here to talk about tax, so there's no need to clear the room just quite yet. Uh, I guess there's a couple of areas I want to talk about. Uh, setting the scene around you know, what the innovation environment is like here in Ireland at the moment. Um, I'll give a very quick overview of the new R&D tax regime. I'm going to fly through that because I'm, I'm going to assume that most people here are pretty familiar with how the scheme works. Um, I'd like to focus a little bit on, on, on certainly my experience with, with dealing with clients uh, through the Irish revenue process because that tends to be quite a sticking point. Um, and finally then I'll, I'll touch on the, the, the KDB regime which was brought in um, last year and uh, which companies are, are starting to, to get interested in. Uh, so I guess just, just setting the scene, um, you know, over the last decade or so there's been uh, an increase of about 1.5 billion euros worth of R&D spend in Ireland um, and the trajectory is only going one way. Um, we have, uh, there's a number of independent studies that have been released over the last number of years to showcase that the Irish R&D ecosystem ranks up there among the best in class internationally. So our ability to compete for foreign direct investment and also to, to sustain R&D um, within the island of Ireland um, is up there amongst the best in class. Um, there's clearly uh, a little bit of a way to go in terms of meeting our EU target of 3% GDP for R&D. Um, and both you know, the, the government agencies through Enterprise Ireland, IDA, SFIA, etc. And indeed the government itself have recognised this. So the IDA have a, a five-year strategy around um, you know, boosting R&D spend by an extra 3 billion euro, which is equating to about 900 investment projects. So you know, setting the bar quite high, but, but, but something that, that, that's really attainable. Um, similar, the Irish government, um, in, within its 2020 government strategy, um, wants to double R&D spend in Ireland by 2020 uh, and make Ireland a global innovation leader. So, you know, so, so really setting the bar high um, in terms of uh, Ireland as a, as a place to do your R&D. There's a number of areas that can help in terms of significantly reducing the cost of your R&D. All underpinned by our 12.5% trading rate. Um, there's there's the, abil the ability to get grant, grant aid uh, for, for doing research and development projects here in Ireland. There's your 25% which is refundable R&D tax credit, and that's cash refundable, okay, which sometimes gets lost. There's the intangible asset regime, so the ability to write off the cost of acquiring IP over a certain period of time. And, and there's this new KDB regime, um, which is basically a regime to have the tax on profits from exploiting patents or copyrighted software. So, you know, uh, I mentioned that the, sort of the whole R&D ecosystem in Ireland. We clearly punch way above our weight in terms of our ability to attract the, the brightest and best talent into Ireland. And you know, that's there for, for all to see. Uh, you know, every time you pick up the newspaper, there's always new job announcements coming out across the island of Ireland. And predominantly those jobs tend to be in areas of innovation and R&D. And all those tend to do is just they lead to more job creation. And that's clearly front and centre in terms of the Irish government's agenda. Uh, very quickly in terms of the R&D scheme, um, you, if, you're, if you're profitable and paying tax, you can use your R&D credit to erode your corporate tax liability. If you don't pay any corporate tax, that R&D tax credit turns into a cash refund scheme, which is payable over a three year period. Okay, so, so it's, it's a cash refund scheme. Uh, the, the beauty about the Irish scheme is that it doesn't just, um, it's not just confined to the salary costs of the people who are doing the R&D. It's actually the whole infrastructure that, that, that sort of supports that R&D environment that you can claim the cost for is that. So your individuals in the lab and also your light, the heat, the rent, the rates associated with that lab, those, all, those costs can all qualify as well. So what can start off with quite a small enough number can mushroom pretty damn quickly. And remember, that mushroom number, you can get 25% of that back in cash. So it's a really, really lucrative regime. Um, this is the slide that I use just to explain how the regime works. Um, so I, I've taken a, a, an example of a, of a project that qualifies for 20% grant aid. Um, you know, there's ITA people and Enterprise Ireland people in the room who are going to, 20% is probably a bit rich, Ian, but I picked 20% because the math is easy, right? So, so a project that initially costs you 100, with 20% grant aid, you can reduce the cost of that project down to 80. When you take your corporate tax deduction, that's your CT deduction of 12.5%, plus your R&D credit at 25%, a project that initially costs you 100 now costs you 50. Okay, so you can effectively have the cost of doing your R&D in Ireland. And that is one of the, the, the primary reasons why Ireland has been such a great place to attract foreign direct investment into Ireland. 
Um, the, the other uh, sort of recurring trend that I'm seeing a lot of our clients do at the moment is actually start to reflect the benefit of the R&D above the line. Now you might say, so what? Well, actually this is having a huge impact, especially for the SME sector. Um, so this is where, rather than reflect your R&D credit in the tax line, actually bring it above the line and reflect it as a credit against your operating expenditure for R&D. What that does is it boosts your profit before tax number, okay? And for an SME, that's very important, especially if you're looking at a transaction or if you're looking at selling your business. Because most PE houses, most venture capital funds, they value companies on the basis of a profit before tax number. So to the extent that you can move your R&D credit above the line and boost your profit before tax figure, that actually boosts the valuation of your business. That's particularly valuable for an SME um, company. Um, within the, the FDI space, and, and particularly for the multinationals, we're seeing a lot of them doing the same as well. And what that does is it actually increases the cost competitiveness of the Irish site doing R&D versus all other sites around the world. Um, Robert mentioned earlier during his presentation around actually one of make, making Ireland a sticky point for doing R&D here. Um, and actually the ability to make Ireland a lot more cost competitive, competitive uh, for doing R&D is one of the key areas in terms of making Ireland that, that sticky site. Um, so we're seeing a lot more companies doing that in terms of bringing the, the, the benefit of the R&D um, above the, the profit before tax line. Uh, I, I want to spend a little bit of time just focusing on our experience with Irish Revenue. Um, I think it's fair to say that over the past decade there's been a huge surge in the volume of companies that are claiming and also the scale of those benefits. So when the regime was first brought in in 2004, there was less than 50 companies claiming the R&D tax benefit. Last year there was more than 1,600 companies claiming. Okay, so it's an absolute huge surge in the number of companies claiming. And also revenue are starting to pay a hell of a lot more in terms of cash. I think last year, they, for the first time, they exceeded the half a billion euro mark. Okay, so so there, there's, there's an onus on companies when they're claiming it to get cash back from revenue, but likewise there's an onus on revenue to actually make sure that, that, that what companies are claiming for is the right type of stuff. And um, what we're starting to see is there's a, there's a lot more revenue wall activity going on in this space. Um, not surprisingly, because there's a huge amount more companies knocking on revenue's door asking for big chunky checks, Irish Revenue are similarly doing the same and knocking on companies' door seeing, making sure that they have the supporting documentation in place. So making sure that you can support both the financial side of the, of, of the claim and also indeed the science side of the claim. So what you're doing is the right stuff from, from an R&D perspective. Um, this is a real tension point. Um, there's, been, there's been 12 or 13 different versions of, of Irish Revenue's R&D guidelines uh, over, the past, over the past 10 years or so notwithstanding the fact that there hasn't really been much change in the law at all. So there's a little bit of a, a sort of a toing and froing from Irish Revenue's perspective um, in terms of what they interpret as, as good qualifying R&D spend and what they interpret as, as no longer good qualifying R&D spend. And that's creating a, a fair degree of uncertainty out in the community, especially for the taxpayers. Uh, and what that, what, that, what that is doing is um, it's, it, it's it's forcing companies to think about whether they actually should be claiming this type of benefit at all. Uh, and to my mind, it's actually encouraging the wrong behaviour. So if you take a very high level example of sort of the, the 2011 guidelines, these are, these, are, these are published Irish Revenue guidelines where they're saying that you know, the likes of uh, indirect supporting activities do qualify. So, so maintenance, finance and personnel activities. Uh, taking on and paying staff. So, so back in 2011, 2012, those costs were, were actually down on, on revenue's paper as qualifying. Now if you look at the 2015 guidelines, uh, indirect overheads that don't qualify include equipment repairs or maintenance, recruitment fees. So there seems to be a bit of a direct contradiction in terms of what does and doesn't qualify. Now in fairness to revenue, they have put their hands up and said, look, yeah, we got this wrong. We know we're trying to address this, but it does create a little bit of uncertainty in the community. Um, there, are, there are essentially two types of audits. So there's the, the, the there's the normal financial and tax audit, and that is where a revenue inspector will come out, knock on your door, and effectively go down through your, your backup invoices and, and effectively tick and bash the numbers from a financial perspective. Um, we're, we're probably seeing less of that these days, and, and more so actually than the scientific audit. So, so the process around a scientific audit is, is a little bit unique uh, and this is where revenue will write to a business and they will say we're proposing to use Professor X from UCD or uh, Trinity or, or wherever um, uh, and you know, we propose to carry out an R&D audit of, of your R&D claim. 
And um, there is an onus on the business to make sure that you do a bit of due diligence around that process to make sure that that expert fits the bill. I cannot stress this enough. That it's, it's really important to make sure that that expert, A, is the right type of individual to audit your R&D claim from a science perspective. Um, and secondly, and probably more importantly, um, that, the, that that individual isn't going to prejudice your business. So in other words, there isn't anyone on your team that have uh, effectively pissed off that individual in the past. But you'd be surprised how often that can happen. Um, so, so make sure that you do a little bit of due diligence around the, 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 the expert that revenue are proposing to use. Okay. Um, once you go back and give the thumbs up that that individual does um, fit, fit the bill, there's a non-disclosure agreement signed between revenue and the expert because obviously these guys are coming out and all of your crown jewels. Um, and then what happens is that the two individuals will come out to, to do the audit. The revenue inspector will do the, the finance side of things and the, the technical expert will focus on the science side of things. Um, what are the factors influencing revenue on? And I guess I, I put this slide up at a, uh, a recent conference I spoke at at the Irish Tax Institute, which was full of revenue inspectors. Um, I didn't get any objections, so I reckon I'm, I'm sort of there thereabouts in terms of what, what they look for. Um, clearly the size of the claim is going to be the, the, the first and foremost. And, and actually revenue have, have, have audited the big guns already. And in fact, in more cases than not, they've actually audited them on a, on a couple of occasions. Um, are you claiming for cash instead of just pure getting a pure credit? What's your track record like with revenue? Are you a compliant taxpayer? Uh, sometimes revenue at, at a district level will decide, do you know what, North Dublin's going to do just R&D audits for the next couple of months. So you might be unlucky enough to be within that district and actually be, be hit with a revenue audit for your R&D, regardless of the size of your claim. All right, so there's a number of different factors that can, that can play there. Um, the biggest concern on a, on a revenue audit seems to be uh, time of management. Um, in my experience, I've seen revenue audits <coughs> last two days and I've seen revenue audits last more than two years. And that is no exaggeration. Um, it, it is key to make sure that you are adequately prepared when revenue come out and, uh, and carry out your audit. They won't arrive um, and knock on your door and go, surprise, we're here to carry out the audit. They will give you advance notice. Um, and that advance notice is very important to make sure that you, you dot the I's and cross the T's in terms of putting the support, the supporting documentation in place to back up your claim. Um, there are a number of things that can go wrong. Um, I'm not going to focus on everything, and, and these slides are available to, to, to download later on, but I wanted to touch on a few of them. Um, from a technical uh, perspective, the biggest area where I see companies trip themselves up on is not being able to identify what specific time your R&D starts and what specific time your R&D ends. So making sure you understand what your R&D start date is and your R&D end date is is absolutely critical in terms of getting over the over the R&D over, over the R&D hurdle. Um, and the rationale for that is that if you are a little bit vague around when your R&D starts, the, the revenue inspector will come in and say, well, actually, do you know what? Those costs um, before that point in time no longer qualify. So it's really important that you align your R&D start date to when you actually start claiming your, financials, <coughs> your financial costs to back up the claim. Similarly, at the back end, when your R&D ends, that you stop claiming costs associated with your R&D activity at that point in time. And the biggest areas of adjustment is where we see companies claim for costs before their R&D starts and after the R&D ends. And that can be quite a grey area as well. Um, a lack of preparation tends to be another area where companies have tripped themselves up on, particularly from a technical perspective in terms of actually having the technical people not being fully briefed as to what the meaning of R&D is. So, you know, I, I, I've seen a number of occasions where technical folks um, are, are starting to talk uh, quite animated around what they're doing from an R&D perspective, which sometimes doesn't necessarily qualify. Um, and having that conversation in a room where there's a revenue inspector doesn't necessarily go down well. So, so making sure the technical, the technical people within your business are, are adequately briefed from an R&D perspective is, is absolutely great. From a financial side of things, there's a, there's a whole heap of areas that can go wrong. Um, so, so again, around the, the allocation of costs, so what type of costs do qualify, what, costs, what type of costs don't qualify, uh, when those costs qualify and when they don't can be another area. Um, activities that, that effectively you apportion in to, to qualifying versus non-qualifying can be quite, quite tricky as well. So, and, and making sure that you have an appropriate documentation trail to support how you allocate different types of overheads can be really, really important as well. Um, not, not claiming for plant machinery is a big area, so you know, cap, capital expenditure does qualify. I see a lot of companies actually completely miss out on, on that fact um, and can significantly underestimate the value of their claim. 
and, and making missing the, missing the 12 month time limit can, can often be a big factor as well. Revenue are adamant that as soon as you go 12 months after your year end, you cannot make an R&D claim. So make sure that you, you, you start putting the processes in place as you go to support your R&D claim and get that claim in as early as you can. Uh, there are a number of problems. I'm not going to focus on, on too many of them now because they'll probably come out um, in a panel session later on. Um, but, but suffice it to say, the biggest area that I see that, that, that is quite problematic is actually a lack of consistency being applied in audits. So I mentioned earlier that revenue bring in technical experts from typically from academia um, to, to effectively audit the, the science test of these claims. Um, the issue with that is you've got some, some uh, college experts who set the bar here, some set the bar here, some set the bar all over the place. So, so actually having academia um, not, not being appropriately trained on a consistent basis it is, is, making, it is having the effect that the audits aren't actually being applied on a consistent basis as well. Um, and one of the biggest areas we see is that the fact that where you've got uh, someone from pure academia coming out to audit a claim in a commercial R&D environment. That can be sometimes very tricky to, to convince the expert that what you're doing is, is qualifying R&D. Uh, and it should be qualifying R&D. Um, there tends to be a, a, a pretty long delay in terms of the use of experts' reports. Um, so we've seen, you know, we've seen um, a significant amount of time in terms of um, experts signing off on whether uh, qualifying R&D is happening or not. Um, uh, and in my view, that, that sort of needs to change. There's no indication on the day of the audit whether the company is doing the right stuff or not, and I, and I think that's another area that, that can potentially change as well. So there's a number of solutions that are proposed up there. Um, there's a number of areas where I feel that the regime can be enhanced, uh, particularly from an SME perspective. Um, and again, this is something that will come out in a panel discussion later on, I, I suspect. Um, just briefly to, to fi finish off around the knowledge development box, as I said, you can, you can have the tax on profits from exploiting uh, patents or copyrighted software. That, that's what the knowledge development box is in a nutshell. Um, in order to be claiming the knowledge development box, you have to be eligible for the R&D tax credit. That's something that, that sometimes gets missed. Okay? So it's not that the R&D tax credit or the knowledge development box. It's the R&D tax credit and the knowledge development box. So this is an added benefit for companies who are doing R&D. And one would think that because of there's a because there's a fairly stringent documentation process required from an RD tax credit perspective, you should be able to leverage a hell of a lot of that documentation in terms of the ability to support your knowledge development box claim. Um, the main areas that, that qualify are effectively around patents and copyrighted software. There are other areas that I'm not going to go into. Uh, marking related IP doesn't qualify, so the likes of trademarks, image rights, brand names don't, don't qualify. Um, there is a definition of IP that's, that's geared towards SMEs, so you don't actually have to go through the full rigours of getting a patent. We just have to have it being certified as, as novel, um, non-obvious and useful, um, and that's something that, that, that's been implemented already. Um, and, and there's a specific formula that, that you need to calculate in terms of uh, quantifying your, your KDB benefit, which I can, which I can elaborate on further. Um, there is a time limit. The time limit is actually two years from, from, from the end of the accounting period in which you're doing your KDB activities. So there is a little bit of time. Um, now that said, you should be putting in place a process uh, uh, and, a, uh, and a mechanism to track your documentation to align to your KDB and indeed to align to your own tax credit now. So, so that in the event that you get selected for a revenue audit, and let's be honest, you probably will, that you have that documentation to support the claim. There, as I said, the documentation it can be quite onerous, but if you're claiming your R&D tax credits, it should be simply just an added on benefit to, to claim your, your knowledge development box if you're doing uh, patented and copyrighted software type activity. Um, there's quite a, big, uh, quite a lot of interaction between the, the, the R&D credit regime and the KDB regime, uh, as one would expect. So you know, it's the same definition of R&D, um, the, the asset must be used for, for qualifying R&D activity, one would suspect or on audit that the technical experts that are going to be used for R&D claims are going to be used for KDB claims as well, because there's such a there's such a huge overlap between uh, the technical expertise. Um, you know, so there's quite a big overlap between your KDB uh, uh, entitlements and your, your R&D tax credit entitlements. So the KDB, as I said, is it, it shouldn't be too onerous to claim that in addition to your R&D tax credit. Uh, and I guess you know, what should companies be doing now? Um, well, first and foremost, they, they should be identifying those, those assets, so those, those patents, those copyrighted software that can effectively have the tax on, on, on profits from exploiting those assets. 
Um, you, you should be identifying those assets now. You should be putting in place a documentation trail to support your, your R&D uh, expenditure associated with that activity. Um, you should be reviewing your group structure to make sure that the, the Irish company is the one that's entitled to the benefits from that IP, um, because if not, you don't, you're not entitled to claim the KDB. So that, that's a slight difference from, from the R&D tax bill. Um, and I guess you know, the key message is, make sure you have a, a, a system that tracks your expenditure um, that you can use to, to show to the likes of Irish revenue, or indeed to the likes of technical experts from academia, that this is how you track and trace your R&D expenditure. Um, and finally, just to, to sum up, look, we've, we have a team of engineers and scientists working in a big four accountancy firm, which may come as a big surprise. Um, most of my team are, are, are engineers and scientists, so we help a lot of companies through this process. Um, and I'd be delighted to, to sort of talk to, to anyone after this event if you'd like to, to come and have a chat. Thank you very much.